Hello, Vlad, are you there? Hello, hello. Okay, 20 minutes.
Hey, John. How are you doing? Pretty good. John, you saw the place, right? Hey, that, yeah, man, that looks like a wow. Hey, Vlad. Hi, John, I need to talk to you. Yeah, I need to talk to you, too. Yeah, we have this uh, International Meningioma Society. Okay. And I am the president of this society, and we were talking about the organizing the webinars on a bimonthly uh, rota. Uh, yeah. And there are people like, uh, you, you know, Osama al Mefti and uh, James Liu and uh, McDermott from UCSF. Would well, you be willing and able to do it for us? Yes. What date is it? Uh, we were talking about 11th November, the first. Yeah, that should be good. Uh, I'll make a, uh, yeah, I'm sure it's open. Is it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, should me, I send you a mail or, should I send you a mail or something like that? Yeah, send me an email and give me information about the time, etc. cetera. But okay, it should, it is it the open. address from which you are sending all the invitations? No, I just need a banner or, and just the information about date. No, no, no. I mean, your mail, is it the one from which you are sending out all the uh, invitations? Well, I send them by email, by Facebook, uh, a mailing I know. list. John, I know, but if I am going to write to you, it's just reply to... Okay, you want my email right now? Hey, Vlad. Yeah, well, hey, send how it. are you? I'm going to put it in your uh, WhatsApp. Hey, Vlad. Yeah. Let me find your WhatsApp here, and I'll send it right to you. Hi, Ipe. How, how are you, Vlado? All good? Fine. Long time. I'm just talking to John about organizing the Meningioma Society meetings. Yeah, John is free on 11th November for sure. This is a big meeting. Sure. But it's difficult to get in touch with him. OK, here's my, no, no. Here's my no, email. No, <laughs> Okay, there's my email, Vlad. You got, you got it? How did you send it? Yeah, what's up? I, I just sent it to you, Vlad, on, in your what's up. Oh, yes, it's here. All right, I shall write you the details. Can I? Okay, sounds good. Good. Hey, I, you ought to give a tour of your place uh, during the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. No a, quick, no, a quick tour, you know, at your start. Say, this is where I'm going. It looks beautiful. Huh. Yeah, I mean, uh, this place is beautiful. So we are setting up a unit, you know, I think. This I, you are not uh, well heard. I cannot hear you well. I, you are in a car, aren't you? No, 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 no. No, I, I, I'm at the farm. John, I'm at the farm. I'm just having a lot of background noise here. I got to mute some people. Hey, I was starting a new channel, Neuroanatomy TV. Ah, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah. Victor's starting it off. He's having one presentation every week in neuroanatomy, and we, we hope to get the neurosurgical societies to come to it. Uh, because Bangladesh. Yeah, good. Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah, if you want, if you want to give one, I'll, I'll send you. I'll, I'll show you the schedule. Let me get a hold of it and show you guys. A tentative schedule sent to me by Bangladesh. Uh, there is some background noise, John. Yeah, there's a lot there. Hey, hold on, let me show. Let me show this. Uh, I... This is a tentative schedule. Uh, you see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll send it to you later. But but they said to me, can you get people to do it? And I said, hell, I get one guy to do it. Victor Hugo Perez Perez will do it. Uh, of course, so you're welcome to take anyone you want. Uh, no, Pablo no, they Perez can... will do it. Uh, well, we can all we can all do it. Uh, maybe Vlad can share some. I can share uh, maybe the cavernous sinus uh, yeah. and uh, maybe the I Latin. Could do the third region or. 
40 minute magnum, whatever. Yeah, it'll be yes. Monday. Mondays. Uh, I'm trying to get a time. Oh, so this I Monday? Can... Yeah, Monday. That's when, uh, what's when Vic Victor, who's going to do most of them, that's yeah. when he wants to do it. Uh, but I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I'll let you know what we decide. Who's behind that? John, who's behind that? I am on the Neuroanatomy TV. It's another channel. Oh, you are? Yeah, Neuroanatomy TV. And Bangladesh came to me with this schedule. And they said, can you fill it? I said, yeah, I can fill it. Well, hopefully with Victor, we'll do most of them. Uh, and then you guys are always welcome to do any ones you want. Well, okay, I mean, let's uh, fill that in right now. Maybe Jugla Puramen and surgical approaches uh, could be done by Luis Borba. Uh, yeah. Maybe, yeah, Luis Borba could do it and Vlad could do the, uh, maybe Vlad can decide what he wants to do. What, what about I the can... far lateral? Yes, 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 please. Yeah, John, put me on far lateral. Okay, uh, uh, can you write that to me, please? Uh, yeah, Chet. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna send you the schedule, Vlad, and uh, you fill in the appropriate ones, okay? And yeah. I'll send you a schedule. Okay. Yes. When is the date? What is the date? Well, it's every Monday. Every starting Monday. next starting next Monday, not this Monday. Next Monday. Next Monday. Next Monday. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Send it to me. I shall fill some some of that. Yeah, I'll send to both you guys the schedule and just fill good. in what what you want. John, I would recommend Pablo Gonzalez. He would be extremely good and able to. Oh, of do course, of course. Him. Yeah, yeah, that would be yeah. great. Yeah, white, white matter. He would be very good in white matter. Pablo, white matter. Abidjan uh, Shah from uh, yeah. Atul Mumbai. department is extremely good. Yeah, Abida is also very good. Very good. She's very good. Okay. Yeah, we we need more neuroanatomy on the net. Yeah. <laughs> Live. You can never get too much neuroanatomy. I can take over something and I can give you names for others as well as I can do that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I'm going to do, uh, Vlad, is give studios to people that the big neuro, neuroanatomist, like I'm giving Victor his own studio where he can. And I'm going to put anything that he puts somewhere else on the channel, too. Neuroanatomy. Yeah. Sounds great. Okay, here, here, yeah. here it is. Let me, let me share the screen here. We have five minutes. Uh, Did you send it, John? Uh, hold on, I'm just getting the uh, website. Hold on. <laughs> well, it's not coming up. Well, anyways, I'll send you the the address of the website. Uh, so, Neuroanatomy. I have you already quit in Virat Nagar or you are still in Nepal? Well, I am in my farm, but I have quit from Virat Nagar. I am you did? Not, uh, except sometime when they are calling me for some uh, VVIP patients, I'm not going there. Um, I'm enjoying at my farm in 10 days. I am joining the new place. I will send you the pictures of the new place. Do it's, so. uh, really good. good. You saw the pictures? No. No, send me some. No, oh, we, yeah, right. we, Ipe is going to present this place uh, during his talk. Yeah, at the beginning of your talk, just... I must leave. I, I, I will not hear him. Oh, okay. Well, if you can show it now, if you want. Yeah. Show them now. I have sent it to you, Vlad. I have sent it to you on WhatsApp. I see. It's coming. Oops. Okay. Lewis knows about it, right? Uh, Bernard, are you there? Yes, I'm here, John. Hi. Oh, good. Hi. You got a hold of <laughs> Lewis, right? Yeah. Okay. I think we have uh, Professor Marshini is also there. I can see Professor Marshini in this.
Hello. Hello. How are you? Hi. But I, I cannot see you right now. Can you share your, can you on your video also? Oh, let me get my, I'm, I'm pinning myself here. Uh-huh, okay. I'm unpin myself. No, I'm not pinning. Okay, it should go to you. Is it going to you now when you talk? Go ahead. It it's may, may stick into mine. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. oh, okay, there we go. There we I go. I think okay. we have uh, three more minutes to go, right? There we go. Hello, Daniel. I'm Dr. John Bennett. Hello. How you doing? Hi, Is Professor it? Daniel. Hi. You know hi, how to screen hi. share. You know how to screen share, right, uh, Doc? Yeah. How are you? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Can hear, okay. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Nikolai, I imagine that's Nikolai Peeve. Is Nikolai here? I think he is. There's a Nikolai that just checked in. I imagine there's not many guys named Nikolai. Hey, Nikolai, are you here, brother? No, I don't think it's that Nikolai. Oh, okay. I think Dr. Insyok Moon from South Korea is also there. I can uh, see him. Nikolai, your last name's not Peeve, right, Nikolai? He says yes. You're not yeah. talking, though. So you're going to run it, right, Fanad, basically? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to introduce you, and then you run it. You take the questions. Okay. You know, one's the next person's going to come on, and just uh, just do whatever you need to do. Okay. It's tough. The, uh, we had a really good moderator the last talk. Uh, 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 Peter Sapex. Yeah. He, he was, a, I mean, a moderator means a lot. I mean, it keeps things going and talk, you know, relevant questions, calls people in the audience. You guys know how to do it. I know how to do it. But Is Luis Borba here? Not yet. <laughs> you got his, uh, he's, is he speaking first? Uh, I know. No, first, I, first, Professor Marshall is speaking. The second, I think, uh, the, the talks by Dr. Moon and, uh, Professor Ipcherian, and finally we have Professor Louis Borba. Okay. Okay. So there's no hurry for Louis, and we'll just email him. So you ready? Ready to go? Yeah, we are ready. We can. Okay. okay. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from the home of Neurosurgical TV, Miami Beach. Today we have another Neurosurgical Super Sunday with an all-star cast, and I'll let. Vanad, to introduce uh, the people. Welcome, Vanad. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank so, you. Uh, so it's like it's yet another interesting session we are having today. So, greetings, everyone. Today, our session is on CP angle and IAM, Indian lottery meters. Our basic idea is to have endoscopic and open approach talks on this area so that we can get a complete 360 degree anatomical orientation of this region. And to give you the uh, talks, we have the stalwarts of the pioneers in this region here. Uh, we have Professor Daniel Marshoni from Verona, Italy, Professor Luis Borba from Brazil, Professor Aib Charyan, and Dr. Insiok Moon from South Korea. And uh, all these speakers require no introduction to you because uh, all of them are well known across the globe. Professor Daniel Marshoni is considered the father of endoscopic lateral skull based surgery. He is probably the biggest name in this region, at least the lateral skull base among the ENT circle. So he'll be talking to an endoscopic approach and translab approach. And then we'll have Professor Aib Charyan from, uh, who was previously from Nepal, now he's relocating to India. He will talk to you on retro sigmoid and probably some, he'll silent some translab approach also. And we'll have Professor Insyok Moon from South Korea. He has a huge volume of acoustic neuromods in South Korea. He'll show a glimpse of his experience 
and then we have the big name the professor luis borba from brazil who will talk to you on retro sigmoid approach so with these words i would like to invite the first speaker professor daniel marshoni to deliver his lecture professor marshoni the screen is all yours thank you very much uh, um... It's a pleasure to be here and uh, sharing the experience with you regarding uh, internal auditory canal surgery and endoscopic approach, open approach. And if it's possible, I would like to sharing the, the screen with you in order to start with the lectures. Um, okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, this is great. So uh, the topic uh, is, is quite uh, uh, huge because uh, uh, it's mean uh, speak about the translabyrinthine approach and so open approach and also endoscopic transpromontorial approach that is uh, something new in uh, the lateral skull base. Just uh, to start uh, with the experience in the um, translabyrinthine approach, uh, this is our flow chart regarding uh, the brainstem tumor, especially acoustic tumor. And if you are able to see uh, this uh, slide, uh, you can understand that we can distinguish three kinds of tumor. Of course, tumor, really, really large tumor over the three centimeter of tumor, and of course, in, in our clinic, we are performing a microsurgery and we are performing a, a translab approach, transotic approach, but also a retrosigmoid approach in some cases. And uh, or tumor less three centimeter of a diameter. And in this case, uh, we are performing also open approaches, translab or uh, retrosigmoid. And finally, intracanicular tumor. And nowadays, we are performing a total endoscopic approach or a, um, transcanal, transpromontorial approach, depending on the cases. So, just to speak about the translab approach, um, this is a, a typical example of the translab approach. Uh, are you able to see in a good way the, the movie? Yes, yes, yeah. Okay. So uh, the principle of the trans labyrinthine approach, uh, just uh, to uh, show some uh, demonstrative video. Uh, okay, like this, for example. The principle is really uh, simple because it's uh, used the uh, the mastoid and of course the temporal bone just in order like a surgical corridor in order to reach the internal auditory canal and the cerebello pontinengo in order to uh, reduce uh, the morbidity, especially the retraction of the cerebellum. This is the line of incision and uh, the first step is to perform a wide mastoidectomy and just to elevate the, the flap here and after we can start with the mastoidectomy. And you can see here, this is the spine of Henle, the posterior wall of the canal. We can start the dissection of the, um, of the mastoid. One of the most important aspects of the um, translabyrinthine approach is especially to decompress in a good way the middle cranial fossa and the lateral sign. So it's really important, especially for the beginner, to remove all the bone around the sigmoid sinus and all the bone around the middle fossa in order to decompress as much as possible this structure when you're working in the cerebellum pontine angle. After this, uh, you have to see uh, the labyrinthine block and you have to following uh, the posterior fossa uh, from the labyrinthine block, detaching the, the dura from the bone. And after you can start after detecting the facial nerve, the labyrinthectomy. The first step is to remove uh, the lateral uh, canal, maintaining the anterior wall of the lateral canal in order to protect the facial nerve. And after you can remove all the lateral, the superior semicircular canal and the posterior canal until you are able to reach uh, the, the vestibule. Until 
to reach the vestibule is really important because uh, you can understand clearly the anatomy between the vestibule and the internal auditory canal. The vestibule is one of the most important landmarks in order to reach the internal auditory canal. And just to drill around the vestibule, you can see uh, the internal auditory canal. Now they, we are using more and more the uh, runger in order to remove the bone and exposing the posterior fossa dura. And uh, you have to looking for the jugular valve. This is another important step because the jugular valve, it's really important to consider it the anatomical conformation of the jugular valve before the surgery, especially when you want to decide regarding the approach uh, to the patient because a high jugular valve sometimes is not good for the translab approach and you have to decompress the sinus and uh, is not so easy at the end to reach the cerebral pontine angle and to perform a, a good surgery. This is the internal auditory canal. You can see that we have to skeletonize the canal from the fundus uh, to the porus. And after we have to remove the bone all around the internal auditory canal, it's really important to remove this bone in order to have a good access to the cerebellum pontine angle and also to the tumor inside the internal auditory canal. After this step, we have to uh, open the dura and we have to open the dura of the posterior fossa and after open the dura of the internal auditory canal. Um, this is the incision of the dura. And you can see that we have to remove uh, the, the dura layer. And after, this is the access to the cerebellum pontine angle where it's possible to see the tumor. The indication in our, in our department, we are using translab approach when the patient has a poor hearing function with a middle and also mm, three centimeter uh, cerebellum pontine angle tumor. It's possible to use the translab approach. And uh, instead, if you have a small tumor just located in the angle or just located in the middle cranial fossa, we can use uh, respectively, uh, um, of course, retrosigmoid or uh, middle cranial fossa. This is the dissections of the tumor. And you can see that we can looking for the facial nerve at the fundus of the um, internal auditory canal. And after we can follow the facial nerve and removing the tumor. And uh, at the end, uh, you can inspect the cavity. You can inspect the cavity with the microscope, but also with the endoscope looking for a residual disease in order to, uh, to check every angle. This is the facial nerve inside the internal auditory canal until the entry zone. This approach is, of course, uh, it's really important. Why? Because uh, uh, you can use uh, your instrument over the tumor and uh, without uh, compress the brainstem. You needn't to, of course, uh, retract the, the cerebellum, uh, in order to reach uh, the cerebellum pontine angle. And so you can go directly to the tumor and to the cerebellum pontine angle. At the end of the surgery is like this. You have to remove uh, the hincus and after you have to put the muscle uh, in order to close uh, the eustachian tube and uh, the, the antrum. And this is really important to avoid the uh, uh, leakage in the post-op. And after you have to close with the bony pate in our department, we are using a lot of this method. And after you can fill the cavity with abdominal fat. Sometimes you can perform a, a really a huge approach of the internal auditory canal, a transapical approach, removing all the bone around the internal auditory canal in order to expose the lesion in the cerebellum pontine angle anteriorly with respect to the, 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 the angle. And so you, this is the, the, the section of the transapical approach. Again, another important advantages of the uh, translab approach, uh, we can consider the translab approach also in some cases when you have a tumor like this, this is a young man with a hearing loss with a tumor like this. 
And in the contralateral side, he had a unstable hearing function because a chronic otitis medium. And in a case like this, one of the most important aspects should be the removal of the tumor and in the same time, put a cochlear implant in order to, uh, to try to have a hearing function in the post-op. So when you are able to do this, removing the tumor and also restoring the hearing function, this is the best for the patient. And you can see the TransLab approach with the, the simultaneous cochlear uh, implant. One of the most important aspects of the cochlear implant and the TransLab approach, we should consider it the, um, the indication because uh, you can do this only when you have uh, a small tumor. If the tumor is more big, uh, honestly, in, in our practice, it's really difficult to attend a, a good hearing function also with the cochlear implant. Instead, uh, when the tumor is one uh, centimeter or one centimeter enough, you can use also the cochlear implant and you can have also a good uh, results. And again, this is the compression of the nerve and we saw already. One of the most important step is to perform the posterior tip anatomy. You can see this is the facial nerve. The corda is over there. You have to do a posterior tip anatomy in order to reach the cochlea. And this is the round window. Now we are removing the labyrinthine. And again, we can see the internal auditory canal, and this is the porus, the fundus is here, the porus is here. We can open the dura and reaching uh, the tumor, and this is the tumor and the entry zone of the, tu uh, of the facial nerve, and we can cut the dura of the internal auditory canal, and we can start the dissection. During the dissection is really important to avoid the trauma on the cochlear nerve. This is the cochlear nerve and this is the facial nerve. And you have to detach in a really soft way the tumor from the nerves in order to uh, have a good uh, cochlear nerve and facial nerve at the end of your surgery. And this is the dissection from the tumor. Again, uh, it's really important to do a um, really soft dissection with the scissor over the uh, nerves. Uh, at the end, uh, you can see this situation. This is the cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea and this is the facial nerve. So the nerve uh, are completely preserved and uh, the final check with the endoscope just in order to check uh, it, the residual disease that is um, in a good condition. And after we can put uh, the cochlear implant. We can put the implant inside the round window. This is the round window. And uh, of course we have to fill the internal the canal and the cerebellum continental and after you can put the cochlear implant. And this is in, uh, the patients immediately after the surgery. You can wake up immediately uh, the, the patient. And after one month, you can open the uh, implants. So it's another important advancement in my opinion, especially if we are thinking about the NF2 tumor, when uh, you have a young patient with uh, a double tumor with the hearing loss. So it's really important again. And of course, uh, the TransLab approach, but not only TransLab approach, TransTempor approach are really useful also for tumor really huge, especially for NF2. You can see this, uh, uh, NF2 with the compression of the brainstem. And in a case like this, uh, uh, we used the uh, um, transotic approach that is an anterior extension of the translab approach. It means that you have to remove all the ossicular chain and uh, also all the, the um, promontory region. And the limits are the internal carotid artery anteriorly, the jugular bulb and the facial nerve. Uh, which is remain in the canal. And after this, uh, we can remove all the bone in order to reach the posterior fossa. This is possible when you have a tumor 
with anterior extension in the anterior in the C, in CP angle in order to have um, to gain more space and uh, in order to uh, have uh, a more comfortable uh, uh, way to remove the tumor. You can see here the interventory canal was really enlarged because uh, the tumor was uh, really huge and uh, the dissection of the tumor and from uh, uh, the cerebello pontinangle in this case uh, was an F2, so the, the situation was not so easy because of the adhesion of the tumor. And after this, uh, we put uh, a ABI in uh, the Lushka foramen. And the same also when you have a situation like this, you can see here, uh, this is a lady, young lady uh, with uh, a huge uh, tumor in the infratemporal fossa, the geminal schwannoma, acoustic neuroma, facial schwannoma, acoustic schwannoma, a, a facial schwannoma with the discompression of the brainstem. So the situation was really terrible. And also the transtemporal approach, uh, it's uh, another important approach. With this is, was a transcochlear approach with, um, uh, with infratemporal for approach type C in order to remove as much as possible the tumor, in this case, uh, in order to decompress the brainstem. And, um, and this was uh, the results after the uh, tumor removal with the decompression of the brainstem. Anyway, this was uh, regarding the translab, uh, transtemporal approach. When we are using uh, the endoscopic approach uh, instead, uh, uh, to treat uh, the, the acoustic neuroma. Just uh, if you are able to see in, in our uh, schematic slide, uh, we are using this just when uh, we have uh, a condition like this, intracanalicular tumor in a patient with uh, less of 75 years old. When we are performing observation and during observation, we are able to see a growing of the tumor. In a case like this, uh, we uh, are using the surgery. And for the surgery, we can use the transcanal, transpromontoyer approach for sporadic acoustic tumor growing in the cerebello pontinangle and especially with the limit of the pores. So it's really important to consider the transcanal endoscopic approach for a tumor located here with a minimal extension in the cerebellum pontinangle, or for intralabyrinthine tumor. The intralabyrinthine tumor are tumor located inside the cochlea or inside the vestibule growing in the interlocutory canal with or without cerebellum pontinangle in vision. Of course, if you have a small tumor growing with a normal hearing function, we are using a middle cranial fossa. And uh, this is a typical example, but we know very well the cranial, middle cranial fossa. But when you have a patient uh, grow with a growing tumor in the interlocutory canal with a poor hearing function, we are using this new approach that is a transcanal, transpromontorial approach. It was born from endoscopic expertise in the middle year. And you can use the external auditory canal in order to reach the internal auditory canal. It's meant to have a minimal invasive surgery because you needn't to uh, uncover the door of the posterior fossa, to uncover the door of the middle fossa, to manage the cerebellum, to open the cistern. You just reach the door of the internal auditory canal and you are able to uh, remove the bone and to uncover the door of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porus in a, in a perfect way and in order to remove a tumor like this. You can see this is a young man with a tumor growing during the follow-up entering into the cochlea. You can see here the tumor was entering into the cochlea but was located in the porus. So it means that it's not in the cerebellum pontinangle, just a little bit, but uh, this was a perfect case to remove uh, through the canal. The principle is to use the external auditory canal 
as a natural corridor in order to reach the lesion to move our instrument just over the tumor, but not over the middle fossa, posterior fossa, or brainstem. And uh, like, uh, for example, the transnasal approach for uh, anterior skull base, the same principle. And just to describe the approach, and uh, these are some cases. This is the case of the young man. You can see this is the eardrum, the right side eardrum, the mellus here, the external auditory canal, the skin. The first step is to remove uh, the skin of the external auditory canal. You can see the incision is a single differential incision and you have to detach the skin from the bone all around and you have to remove uh, the skin of the ear canal with the eardrum and, and block. You can see now we removed the skin of the external auditory canal with the eardrum and now we are watching inside the tympanic cavity. This is the malleus here, the incus is here, the eustachian tube is here. And in order to, um, to gain space with the drill, we have to remove all the bone of the external auditory canal. And the limit are the anterior limit is the temporal mandibular joint. The inferior limit is the jugular valve. The posterior limit is the third portion of the facial nerve. You can see this is the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, turn over there and become a mastoid segment of the facial nerve. And the superior uh, limits, of course, is the tegment of the middle fossa. And you can see here, after this, we enlarge the external canal and we have to remove the incus, detaching the, the incus from the stapes. You can see here, removing the incus is here. And after we have to remove the malleus. So we have to cut the anterior ligamental fold of the malleus and, and now this is the situation of the osseocularic chain removal. This is the anterior, posterior, superior, inferior. And in front of you, you can see the facial nerve. The tympanic segment of the facial nerve is here. This is the geniculate ganglion with the cog and the cochlearyform process with the tendon tendon of the muscle is over there. The stapes, the promontory region where is located the cochlea with the round window and the third portions of the facial nerve turn over there. And here you can see this bone is called fustis and this is the finicus bone. So now the second step is to remove the stapes in order to uncover the vestibule. Removing the stapes, we are entering into the vestibule and this is the medial wall of the vestibule. And now we know that here you can see this brown spot. This is the spherical recess. The spherical recess is where is located the attachment of the inferior vestibular nerve and is a landmark in order to understand where is located the fundus of the internal auditory canal. In this way, we know where the facial nerve run, especially the, the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve. The labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve run from the genical ganglia to the spherical recess in this way. So this is the line of the, in, the labyrinthine portions of the facial nerve. And the fundus of the internal auditory canal is located here between the vestibule and the cochlea. So we can start to remove the promontory region in order to, to see the cochlea where it's located. And you can see this is a piezoelectric drill that we are using more and more in this kind of surgery. And we remove the promontory region and now we can see the cochlea. This is the basal turn of the cochlea. This is the middle turn and apical turn of the cochlea. And this is the vestibule. Again, the spherical recess is here. If we are removing this bone between the cochlea and the vestibule that we call it the cochlear vestibular bone, of course, if we are able to remove this bone, we are reaching the fundus of the internal auditory canal where the internal auditory canal is more, is more superficial. So we can start the removal of this and you can see this is the fundus of the internal auditory canal and we can start the dissection of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porous in order to remove all the bone. 
In this case, you have to be careful because you can understand where the internal carotid artery run. And always we have to see where the carotid artery is located just to see. And this is again, the facial nerve, the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. The vestibule was here and we remove all the bone of the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the porus and this is the tumor. After this, we can start the dissection of the tumor from the internal auditory canal. And again, when you are lucky, but sometimes it's really difficult to have a luck like this, you can move the capsule of the tumor and you can see now the leakage because when you see the leakage, it means that you are reaching the posterior portions of the tumor. And after you have to detach the tumor from the facial nerve. This is the facial nerve. And so you can start the, the, the touch of the tumor. How is possible to uh, move the instrument? If you are able to remove more and more the bone in the external auditory canal, you can use the same technique of the anterior um, skull base. It means that um, uh, mm, one of your staff can hold the endoscope and you can use also two hands in order to remove the tumor. So is not uh, so difficult. After this, you have to put uh, a fat in order to close the internal auditory canal and also to fill all the cavity. And we have to uh, suture the external auditory canal. Another important aspect of the endoscopic approach is when you want to remove a tumor like this. There are a really small tumor, intralabyrinthine tumor located in the cochlea or in the vestibule, but um, the indication are for uh, surgery because uh, it's really difficult to control the symptom of the patient. These patients are with a hearing loss uh, with a terrible vertigo. So the indication is for surgery. And uh, these kind of tumor are really easy to remove um, uh, with the endoscopic approach. Again, this is the right side and we have to remove uh, the skin and the drum. We have to drill all around the, the external auditory canal. After this, we can see here the ossicular chain, the facial nerve is here. Uh, we remove the ossicular chain, the facial nerve, the stapes, and the tumor in this case is inside the cochlea. So we have to remove the promontory region, reaching uh, the, the tumor, removing the stapes, and again, we can remove, uh, this is the cochlea, and again, the same situation, the vestibule, the facial nerve, the basal turn with the tumor, the medial turn and apical turn of the cochlea, and this is the uh, piezo surgery that we remove until the fundus of the internal auditory canal. This was a cochlear schwannoma involving the fundus of the internal auditory canal. We can start with the removal of the tumor from the cochlea. You can see that was filling all the cochlear turn, and this is the tumor. And after this, we can start to remove the last piece of the tumor from the fundus. You can see the leakage and the after this, it's really important to see uh, the um, anatomical conformations of the nerve. This is the cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea, and this is the inferior and superior vestibular nerve. The facial nerve is always in the middle, but more deep. We can see more in detail, again, cochlear nerve entering into the cochlea, and the vestibular nerve, and this is the facial nerve in the middle and the perspective is quite the different with respect to um, the translab approach, but it's really interesting to see the nerves in this kind of perspective. And again, nowadays we are able also to remove tumor and to put a cochlear implant in the same uh, approach in a simultaneous way. So uh, we started to do a transpromontory approach with the cochlear implant and uh, we are collecting now the data about this kind of patient. Another patient. This approach was born from endoscopic approach. 
But uh, in order to improve our technique, we convert uh, this approach in a microscopic approach. We call it expanded approach, transpromontorial expanded approach. Why? Because, uh, mm, because the anatomical knowledge, we uh, decided to, to start with the endoscope. After this, uh, with the microscope, you can do the same. Look this case with the tumor located in the, mm, in the pyramidal, in the, in the petrus apex along the internal carotid artery and uh, uh, along the internal auditory canal. In this case, we decided to do this approach with the, the microscopic uh, um, instrument. You can see here, the incision is like a chambord, just an incision like this. And um, the, the approach is the same of the endoscopic approach, but of course you need to enlarge more and more the external auditory canal. And again, you have to remove the ossicular chain. And after you can start with the same uh, anatomic knowledge. So when you are performing a microscopic approach, uh, it's quite different with respect to the endoscopic approach because you need more space. And so it's really important to remove more and more bone around the extremity canal. And um, also it's really important to uh, check your anatomical limits in a very good way. And this is the results at the end of the surgical uh, approach uh, transpromontorial with the endoscope in, at the end in order to check if there is some residual disease. Just in order to, um, to show you um, this microscopic approach, I would like to see this, uh, um, this movie. Again, we are in the right side and this is external auditory canal and we are removing the skin and the eardrum and we can see the same step with the microscope with respect to the endoscope. In this case, uh, uh, the tumor was located in the internal auditory canal, but growing in the straight line with the external auditory canal until the entry zone, so in the cerebellum pontinengo. But you are able also to get a good surgical window in order to reach the cerebellum pontinengo if you need. You can see this is after um, skin eardrum removal. We have to drill all around the bone, all the bone of the anterior portion of the external auditory canal until reaching the temporal mandibular joint here and all the bone here in order to gain your surgical window. Again, malleus, incus, and you have to reach the third portions of the facial nerve in order to have a, a good uh, surgical view. And look now the situation, we have to drill more and more the bone and because you have in this way, this is the third portion of the facial nerve, incus malleus, the temporal mandibular joint, the carotid artery one here, this is the promontory region. And um, the view is really nice also with the microscope because it's a straight operation. It's not like uh, um, uh, the middle ear that you need to see uh, around the angle. And uh, the malleus removal, we have to remove the stapes. And uh, look the situation of the facial nerve. We can see uh, really clearly the facial nerve where it's run and we have to remove the stapes. And after you can see this white stop spot, this is the spherical recess. Or let me, this is the spherical recess where the, the facial nerve run, the, the, sorry, where the inferior vestibular nerve run. And it's really important in the microscopic technique to remove the cochlear, to the cochlear reform process in order to gain space anteriorly. And this is the, removal of the uh, cochlear reform process. And after this, uh, we have to looking for the carotid artery because we need more space with respect, uh, of course, the endoscopic approach. And so you can see uh, then the internal carotid artery is uh, uh, our anterior landmark in order to uh, stop our dissection anterior. And you can see here, this is the carotid. 
and this is the carotid, and we know that the carotid valve here, we know that the jugular valve is here. It's really important to check the, the, um, the CT scan uh, before, because uh, if you have a high jugular valve, this approach is contraindicated. And after this, we can start uh, with the, the removal of the cochlea. You can see here, this is the basal turn again. And after we can start to remove anteriorly in order to, um, to, to uncover the middle and apical turn, middle apical turn. Again, look at the situation. There is the vestibule is here, basal turn, middle and apical turn, facial nerve, and this is the cochlear vestibular bone. If I remove this, I can go directly to the fundus of the internal auditory canal. And this is the carotid. So we can remove the cochlear vestibular bone until I can see the more superficial portions of the internal auditory canal. And after this, uh, we can follow the internal auditory canal until the pons. We can check it here, just uh, look. This is the internal auditory canal from the fundus to the pons. It's really important to remove all the bone around the internal auditory canal. You have already your landmark, the carotid artery anteriorly, posteriorly, the third portions of the facial nerve, superior the facial nerve, tympanic segment, inferiorly the jugular bulb. And if you remove all this bone, you are able to reach the posterior fossa dura. You can see now, this is the blue line of the posterior fossa dura. And after you can start to remove all the bone and after you can open the posterior fossa dura. We, you can cut the posterior fossa dura and the, the view when you cut the posterior fossa dura through this approach is the entry zone. You are in front of the entry zone of the facial nerve. So um, you must know that you can reach the, the, the entry zone of the facial nerve you can see the, the entry zone of the facial nerve is here. And after you can start to dissect the tumor with the two hands. So it's quite diff different with respect to the endoscopic approach because you, you can remove more and more bone and also you can move your instrument in the angle with a more um, safe uh, condition. You can see here the vascular structure and this is the facial nerve in the entry zone and this is the tumor and uh, you can detach uh, and uh, you can reach the tumor and remove. And this is the, the final view after tumor removal. And you can see this is the entry zone, the brainstem, the facial nerve run over there and turn in this way. And uh, so just in order to show the possibility of the transcanal approach, of course, uh, but when you have a tumor in the angle, Honestly, nowadays I'm using a translab, but this is a new view, a new approach, and uh, that you can use. Honestly, for the internal auditory canal, probably the transcanal approach now is, um, in my hand, of course, the best. And uh, so uh, we we have also some uh, our. Um, paper regarding the use of the endoscope, of course, uh, uh, in the translab approach, uh, in the Petrus Apex, and also the results in 2017 of 49 patients underwent transcanal transpromontorial acoustic neuroma surgery regarding the facial nerve outcome. And uh, of course, the outcome is really promising. Uh, so um, I would like to finish my presentation. This was uh, our uh, lateral scalp base surgery. Unfortunately, it was not possible to do because the coronavirus, but um, I hope that uh, the next year, if everything will be fine, we will be able to do it. So I would like to see you in Verona. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Marshall. It was an excellent lecture. A lot of new things have, has been described over here. Um, there are a couple of questions by the Delegates. One of them was, do you drill the bone over the sigmoid sinus in a translab approach, or you retain the bone there? Yeah, uh, in the in the sigmoid, yes. I 
always drill the bone over the sigmoid sinus uh, anterior and posterior in order to decompress the sinus because it's really important, in my opinion, especially when you are working uh, inside the cerebral pontine angle, where when you are able, you can leave just a small amount of bone over the sinus just to protect the sinus. But honestly, it's not so... Um, the, the big difference is to uh, decompress the, the sinus as much as possible. And the second question was, if the tumor is very much adherent to the brainstem, is it still possible to do a translab approach? Yeah, it's possible, uh, but of course, uh, when uh, the tumor is uh, huge, uh, it's always boring because you have to, to perform the bulking, central debulking, and you have to spend a lot of hour in order to debulk the tumor in the middle. After, when you finish your work of the debulking, you can manage uh, all the peripheral aspect of the tumor and is more comfortable. But uh, the secret of the huge tumor is the, the bulk in the central way, the tumor, until uh, it's possible to uh, detach the peripheral aspect of the tumor. And the next question I would like to ask is, you, you described the transpermontal microscopic approach. And I saw you going till the posterior fossa dura and the root entry zone. So what would be the size of tumor, the maximum size of tumor, which can be removed by this new approach? Yeah, it's, uh, this is a, a good um, question because uh, uh, at the end, uh, uh, at the beginning, we, we thought about uh, how large should be the tumor. Nowadays, one of the most important aspect, if you want to use this uh, working in the cerebral pontine angle, is to see the, 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 the shape of the tumor because the tumor should be in the internal auditory canal and can go also inside the cerebral pontine angle, but in the straight line, uh, regarding the internal auditory canal. It's better don't perform this surgery when the tumor is growing in the cerebral pontine angle, touching uh, the trigeminal nerve or the lower cranial nerve. And uh, this is a simple uh, method to understand uh, which kind of patient can uh, undergo to this surgery. Thank you, Professor Marshall. It's an excellent lecture. Thank you once again. And I would like to invite Professor Louis Borba because he was not there when I introduced him. Uh, Professor, Professor Borba, are you around? John? Is Professor Borba there? Yeah, Louis is here. Uh, I can see him, Louis. Uh, Louis? Louis, can you respond? Uh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see Louis. Uh, I don't. No, no, Louis. Louis is here. I can see him. He's, okay. Uh, okay. Great. Great. Louis. Uh, let's see here. Can't find him. I. No, no. He's here. He's here. Okay. I'm calling him. I'm calling him on the, on the WhatsApp. Okay. Okay. Uh, I sir, you have some questions or some comments on this approach. Well, um, Louis, you are asked to be in the presentation, Louis. Uh, one second. Yeah, see, uh, we know this is something, this is completely new for me. I've never seen a uh, uh, transcanal, transpermontary approach. So, I mean, I really appreciated uh, the beauty of the surgery. I mean, for me, it would be a very, very narrow corridor. And I really appreciate, I mean, the experience uh, of Professor Mashuni. So, how he's going about the things and it's beautiful surgery. I mean, needless to say, it's beautiful surgery is a master. So uh, thank you very much. That's all I can say. Then thank you for introducing all kinds of, uh, you know, all these approaches, bringing everything together. I must give the credit to you. Thank you, sir. And I will probably, if uh, Professor Borba is not on, maybe can you start your next presentation, sir? Professor Ipcherian? Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. So, Borba, uh, Luis, you, are you there, Luis? Yeah, he's yes, on. Yes, I'm here. Oh, there he is. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> hey. Ip, you want to introduce him? No. Ip, you can sure. go first. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I will take 10 minutes because um, I have just two cases to show. Um, 
Okay, I'm going to share now. I was taking a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, we will start with, uh, I mean, we will just show two cases, surgical videos. I mean, uh, the thing is, in CP angle, neurosurgeons most often, they resort to the retrosigmoid uh, approach. Now for us, uh, the only time the retrosigmoid approach is difficult is when it is a very, very large tumor. Now, and somebody has gone and shunted this patient, then the systems are not there. Then, you know, the surgery becomes, if retrosigmoid surgery becomes a real big problem because, uh, you know, you are trying to retract the cerebellum. And if you're not able to retract the cerebellum, taking one third of the cerebellum and all is something that we've seen in the past, we've done in the past, too. Now, it's not very elegant. So there I would uh, choose a translab. Uh, sometimes I combine a translab with a retrolab, uh, retrosec because it's, it's rather very easy. You do some uh, decompression and then come retrosec, which is your family corridor again. So we're gonna show you how we do again, with respect, when you're, uh, when you're starting off your surgeries, uh, one of the things that you can do is, uh, you know, uh, attention to details like, where is the tumor? What is the relation of the brainstem with the tumor? What is the relation of the cerebellum with the tumor? What is the angle of the Peters Ridge? All these things are things that you would like to know. And again, uh, one of my favorite positions is the sitting position. Uh, it's very good because, you know, you don't have blood and uh, anything blocking your field. Everything is going to flow down. The only problem is uh, you're going to be standing with a, you're going to be standing uh, in a very, very, uh, I would say awkward position for, you know, for your shoulders, for sure. The rest of the, the rest of it is okay, but for your shoulder, it's going to be real uh, stress. So unless you know how to keep resting and operating, it's 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 a bit uh, it's a bit of a problem. So we uh, two cases that we've done we we using the supine oblique or lateral position here. So navigation is not really required. That is a point set around this. I use it as a a retractor because it's, it's sometimes very very useful uh, than the much much better than the lila so uh, that is the setup so we set up the point setter this is the usual incision that we use and that is where the craniotomy we do so of course the most important thing first in a, such a big tumor is obviously uh, getting into the cisterna magna you must look at the cisterna magna uh, in the scan, and if there is a cisterna magna, then it's very good. But sometimes um, I have a lot of problems with guys who shun these patients, and then when you shunt it, then the cisterna magna tends to disappear, especially in large tumors, and then you'll have to go and uh, take out the C1 arch. So once the cerebellum is a bit lax, then you can go ahead and uh, incise. Um, and once you incise, you can connect these two incisions you know everything is under very high magnification so the entire dural um, uh, dural uh, incision is hardly 2.5 centimeter once the csf comes out uh, you can just take a stitch you know uh, there are some advantages if you drill over the uh, sinus expose the sinus and uh, turn the sinus over uh, sometimes it's required, sometimes it's not. Okay, so you don't have to maximize everything in the beginning. So this is where you get a lot of CSF. Once you get a lot of CSF, things are going to be much easier. You must understand this tumor is uh, a big tumor, comes very superficial than you usually think. So retracting the cerebellum and the tumor together is a mistake that a lot of people do. 
this is something that you should avoid. So you should uh, slip, you should gently slip the cerebellar arachnoid over the tumor. That is what you need to do. Once you do that, you're going to be able to get the tumor capsule and you're going to be dissecting the arachnoid. Every arachnoid belongs to the brain. So once now what you are doing is, that's a tumor, that's a huge tumor. So the huge tumor is what you do is you gently mobilize after you've done enough decompression, you can gently mobilize from superior, from inferior. Don't worry too much about uh, the bleeding or don't try to stop it uh, unless of course you are, uh, you have a major bleeder, that means your surgical technique is very bad. Don't worry about this oozing and always use the CUSA or CUSA or something which you can fix the tumor and decompress. Now, if you pull the tumor chunk out, that can be the reason for your facial nerve. So CUSA, most important thing about the CUSA is that, that in a CUSA, you are not causing any movement. You know, the facial nerve, and the eighth now, if you want to preserve, the main thing about them is imagine a noodle sitting and you have the tumor sitting on the noodle. So if you are pulling the tumor, the noodle is going to break for sure. And the noodle is really stretched out. So if you avoid movement of the tumor, then you are at a very, very safe way. I mean, even when you you should not really push, pull, do anything. So decompression should be with the CUSA. That is why CUSA is extremely important. Otherwise, if you don't have CUSA, you should fix the tumor with a dissector and then use a kerosene or a, I mean, not a kerosene, a pituitary punch to uh, take out the tumor. This is also a very good uh, technique, but provided you fix the tumor. But if you are pulling and pushing the tumor, I mean, your facial nerve may be preserved anatomically, but then you're going to have a problem with uh, uh, the facial nerve. I mean, uh, it will be only an anatomical preservation. That's not exactly what you want. I mean, nobody's going to look at your anatomical preservation and then say, bravo. So that is, uh, after this tumor is a huge tumor. So we have, uh, of course, anatomically uh, preserve the facial nerve, uh, the eye car, all those anatomy you can see there. And uh, then you can see the size of the neural opening. And then we, um, of course, we uh, cover this, you get, get your hemostasis, irrigate uh, very well and uh, do the dural closure and then keep the craniotomy back. So this is what, so you can see starting from the 10 all the way down to the nine, 10 nerves. Uh, you can see after this resection. So you must always remember that the facial nerve comes from a higher level than the anterior part of the tumor. So it's very easy to put in your suction and destroy the facial nerve. This is something that as beginners, we've all done. So uh, it's very easy to take that tumor away I mean, along with the facial nerve, especially in a situation like this. You know, this is a cystic tumor, but you know, the problem with the cystic tumors are that they're very easy to take out, but they are also easy to take out with the facial nerve. You're not very careful. I'll show you what I mean. So this is a cystic tumor. Now the, uh, you, the plane of, this tumor with the facial nerve. Sometimes if you are unlucky, the plane can be bad with the brainstem as well, but usually the plane with the facial nerve in a cystic tumor is not great. So preservation of facial nerve has to be, uh, when you leave a little bit of tumor uh, into uh, on the facial nerve, that's exactly what we're gonna do now. So again, opening just like before, uh, opening below, uh, to get the cerebellum lax, take out enough CSF. And once you're done with that, then you don't mobilize here. You know, you see, you don't mobilize. So you start decompressing the tumor with whatever window you have. Get into the cyst. Uh, don't try to roll out the cerebellum here because it won't roll out because the plane is not going to be good like the other tumor. 
So if you try to uh, mobilize everything, then it's going to start bleeding. And then uh, when it starts bleeding, you know, you start getting a little bit faster and you start coagulating on the plane of the tumor. And that is not a good thing. You can, you know, one thing is you can coagulate inside the tumor. You should never coagulate outside the tumor. That's going to take off your arachnoid plane. And uh, that's, so you must always have a facial nerve monitor. This is the only place. I mean, generally, uh, other tumors, uh, I, I rarely, you know, I hardly use the facial nerve monitor only in the end. But this one, you should have the facial nerve monitor. You should uh, stimulate the different currents. You can see the fifth nerve there, starting to see the fifth nerve and the tenth there. And that, that, that is a facial nerve will be coming there. So you need to be very clear as to where is your facial nerve. So that is where you can use your, uh, you can go anterior to the facial nerve there and see the arachnoid there. And once the facial nerve is completely free from the tumor, in fact, after you uh, cut the tumor or away from the facial nerve, even leaving a level of leaving a bit of a tumor on the facial nerve, then you can, once you mobilize this facial, I mean, this tumor, then you can take out this cystic tumor, but not before you separate it. It's, it's a different strategy here. So you can see now, you can see the fifth nerve there, the facial nerve with the tumor there. That is a facial nerve with the tumor. That's a facial bundle there with the tumor. Uh, I have left that tumor on the facial nerve. I don't want to because it's very, very adherent. And then you can go ahead and dissect some tumor off. Um, whatever is anterior, you can dissect this tumor off. But then you want to leave this facial now just like that. And at the end of it, your, uh, once you stimulate, your, your uh, stimulation values are going to be extremely good if you leave this and the patient is not going to have a facial. So that is uh, after surgery and uh, you will see the patient immediately after the surgery. So uh, that is it. So you can say maybe a grade two or grade three house, house in vacuum. So that is about it. Those are the two cases that I wanted to show you. Thank you very much. I think we have a lot of talks and uh, um, I don't want to take much time. Thank you very much. And I, I will start, uh, I, I think I'll stop sharing. Uh, thank you, Prof. Raip Chiran. That's an excellent talk. Uh, just two excellent cases actually. Uh, maybe we would not waste much time and probably could go to the next presentation by Dr. Professor Inseok Moon from South Korea. He would also take it take about 10 minutes to show some interesting videos and then we'll have the talk by Professor Borba. Professor Inseok Moon, are you around? Uh, yes, uh, I'm here. Uh, uh, hi, Professor. Yeah, I can oh. share my slide. Okay, just a minute. Okay, thank you, Vinod. Uh, thank you for giving me this great opportunity. I'm Dr. Yisongmun from Yonsei University from South Korea. And uh, uh, this technique is uh, inspired by uh, Dr. Daniel, uh, Professor Daniel Macchioni, and uh, I learned from this technique originally from him. And before him, uh, the minimally invasive electrolytic mode approach using the endoscope was uh, uh, in introduced by Dr. Jack Manyang from France, and I also uh, learned from this technique from him. So till now, uh, 145 cases of skull-based lesion using transcranial approach was reported uh, for the in the six disease category in the 13 reports, especially for the vascular schwannoma. Uh, but till now, uh, less than 60 cases was uh, were reported. So, uh, sorry. Today, uh, I, I'd like to share my experience uh, about this too much and uh, already uh, original technique was, was uh, touched by the Professor Daniel McUni. So I just want to share uh, very special, special modification and uh, some very special application for the, this technique. Uh, in the transpromontorial approach was uh, criticized by some doctors because uh, this technique uh, need to drill the cochlea to uh, to remove the tumor. So 
it uh, takes a chance for, from the patient of our the cochlear implant. So I try to uh, remove uh, the small tumor simultaneously with the cochlear implant. Uh, this concept is uh, we can service in very small tumor. We can approach it using the not trans total transpromontoria, using the infra promontorial, and then uh, we can uh, remove the tumor, and then we can do the cochlear. This concept uh, was we discussed with many doctors using this technique. Uh, yeah, first case, uh, I, I tried to do the uh, uh, small, small uh, interlabyrinth tumor. The tumor is confined to the utricle. So in removing in this tumor, we can save the cochlea. So it's first case. Uh, similar with the uh, intracochlear, uh, intravascular schwannoma, removing the ossicle and drill the utricle, open the utricle, and we can easily, easily remove the tumor. But uh, tumor was confined and only to the utricle, so we can save the cochlea. So after tumor removal, then we I can I can insert. Uh, tumor uh, cochlear implant electrode. But in the first case, uh, finally, uh, he is a financial problem. I, I couldn't do the real cochlear implant. So just to insert the electrode dummy and for the future, future uh, cochlear implant insertion. But the second case uh, was really, really from the cochlear vesperal removal plus cochlear implant. Yeah, this case is small, tumors confined only in the fundus area. And then uh, I just, uh, uh, I, I do the real vascular schwannoma removal plus cochlear implant. This is a cochlear basal tone. I just uh, removed hook lesion and uh, cochlear vascular junction. So, and then I met the tumor. The opening is very small because uh, I want to preserve the cochlea, uh, mid turn, uh, apical turn, and half of the basal turn. So it's very difficult to remove the tumor, even if it's a very, very small tumor. So after open and uh, removing the, remove the tumor half, then I switch to the microscope for the using the two hands. Uh, it's a last step of the one hand surgery, and then switch to the microscope. In this case, I already already use a lateral auricular incision because uh, uh, I need to insert the cochlear implant. Yeah, this small tumor was removed. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. And then this is a cochlear knob and this is a facial knob. After plugging this opening using the solid cell and uh, some soft tissue like the tragal perichondrium, then I perform the cochlear implant. This is a metal device. And then insert the electrode. in the transcanal corridor. Yeah, I fixed this electrode using the bone dust and the glue. This is a post-op CT scan and a post-op X-ray. You can see the electrode was inserted in the cochlea using the infrapromontorial corridor. Yeah, this is my series. And the second category was a very small facial of Schwannoma. Uh, this is my case of 49 year old female with a facial of schumannoma in the left side. You can see the tumor was uh, in the internal tunnel plus genital ganglion area. And she has already, she had already grade three uh, facial palsy. So we discussed about the uh, many steps and the uh, patient and I decided to remove the tumor and the reconstruct his uh, Facial lobe using the Shura lobe. Yeah, this is a surgical video. 
panic segment to facial law. And uh, in this case, I use the transpromontoria approach. Totally drill the cochlea. And you can see the labyrinth segment, tympanic segment, and the tumor. Tumor is uh, directly connected to the labyrinth segment. And in the IH segment, it's a definitely facial lobe shubanoma. And this is sural lobe. So connect to the IH segment and then labyrinth segment. In the past, in the user classically, we need to drill the whole the bone and uh, open the very widely. It's a very, very uh, big surgery. But in using the, this transformer technique, we, we don't need to any incision in the retroricular or any other. Just the tympanic membrane elevation is enough. So, and and now I try to minimally embase mid cranial hooks approach. It's uh, just uh, my concept. And uh, I, I just named this technique, not, not yet, not yet uh, fixed, but uh, it's my trial. Very big facial lobe shibanoma. In this case, uh, pa patient has very, very intact face, uh, face so he has no uh, facial palsy. So if I remove total this tumor, he got the facial palsy. So uh, I decide to just uh, debulking, debulking in this cystic area and then do the ammonite. So in this case, very small incision and very small craniotomy is needed, just a two centimeter. Uh, so after dissecting the tumor and the middle temporal lobe, it's very cystic. So I just debulking in the cystic lesion, not totally removing because uh, prevent the patient palsy, incision and suck out the uh, fluid and then suck out the tumor content. But we don't know. We don't know uh, how much uh, uh, removing the uh, tumor inside. So we use the patient lobe monitoring plus endoscope. So insert endoscope into the tumor and then check the the very inside, the very medial side the capsule, then stop the surgery and the facial he, patient face is very intact. Uh, last case, last case. So I, I, I can use only two minutes. It's so, uh, one modification, small vesper shubanoma and her hearing was uh, 40 decibel before surgery. After surgery, total removal plus 60 decibel hearing. So in this case also very small incision, small craniotomy, but very small lesion. I cannot wear as well. So uh, check the incus using the endoscope and drill the IAC and removing the tumor. So it's not endoscope approach, but using the endoscope plus microscope uh, we can make it uh, more minimally, more and more minimally. So it's uh, this technique is uh, just uh, improving and uh, improving. So not yet, but very promising. Yeah, this is the last step for the tumor removal. Supposed to MRI, tumor is gone and uh, incision tumor uh, wound closer is a very small wound. Okay, uh, I, I can stop uh, my presentation here because the uh, lateral sigmoid was already, already, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Insyuk Moon. That is an excellent presentation. Um, uh, Professor Aipcharyan, Professor Borba, you have some questions? Well, again, as I said, I, I wouldn't, uh, I, I really don't know uh, much about this approach. So I mean, maybe Luis can uh, ask something. I have no idea about this. <laughs> <laughs> so it's completely new to you. <laughs> 
But very nice, very nice. You see, very nice dissection. Very, the anatomy, you see, perfect in the visualization was wonderful. Congratulations, Maybe Dr. This, Moon. Maybe this is a new evolving techniques. It may have a, yes, yes. Have a role in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll Maybe, talk some, uh, some about yeah. this. Okay. Uh, uh, Professor Borbak, are you ready to deliver your lecture? Maybe, maybe shall we go yes, with your lecture yes, now? I'm yeah. a, so, yes, I'm so ready. the screen is all yours, Professor Borbak. The screen is all yours. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. First of all, I want to thank our friend, great Professor Shirin, for the outstanding work, and John Bennett, that is a visionary. Thing. Many years ago, we started these webinars. Now the world is doing, we follow you. Same idea. Now, neurosurgical TV is a reality for the whole world, for the whole neurosurgeon, but for resident and for medical student that today can reach this knowledge. I will change a little bit my topic. I was planning to talk about a retro sigmoid approach. Nice, but I will change to talk about the vestibular schwannoma. Today you are seeing the world lecture and more lecture about vestibular schwannoma. Surgery, no surgery, radio surgery, hybrid surgery, Everyone is trying to create a new idea, new approach to treat vestibular schwannoma. We know that the vestibular schwannoma, the results are directly related with the size and sometimes the location. We know that there is treatment that work, there are treatment that doesn't work. And there is some situation that you should understand the pathology itself, the disease itself, more than decide any kind of treatment. Not every patient needs surgery, not every patient need to do treatment. I apologize that is, is in Portuguese here because I was just translating here. If you see the natural history of vestibular schwannoma, I will translate for you, okay? The mean growth per year in this paper of Walsh, what 1.16 millimeters per year, you see? 83% grows less than two millimeters per year. 36%, a little bit more than one millimeter per year. 13%, almost 15% decreasing size. If just watch and see. When the tumor is in the CP angle, the rate of growth is larger when the tumor is inside the meatus. It means that it is a very slow growing tumor. In the hearing, the people say about hearing, oh, if you don't do the surgery, they lose the hearing. Okay. The tumor that is growing faster than one millimeter per year, has higher risk to lose the hearing. The tumor that not growing so fast has lower risk to lose the hearing. Now you have the contrapoint. In many Joma, we, we compare a lot radio surgery with natural history. Because the patient that receives radio surgery or radiation therapy for meningiomas, you don't see too much difference 
in the MRI. Looks the same. One year, two years, looks the same. But for vestibular schwannoma, you don't really see the difference. It means that the radio surgery works. It's true. I'm a neurosurgeon. I do surgery. I don't send to radio surgery. I prefer to do surgery. But it's the truth I have to tell to the people. It works. The conservative treatment in this paper by Shurato, his guy was radio surgeon, you know? Oh, sorry, it can come back. See, this paper from radio surgery, you can see. But the, the rate is completely different. It means that you have one treatment that is competing with surgery. It means that the surgery, we need the best result that you can. But it does not mean you have to, to open everybody and do surgery in everybody. And there are two more like this. In 2006, almost nothing. 2011, like this. This patient here in 2006 was sent home and the people said, hey, no worry, these two more, you never go, you live your life forever. The patient disappeared. Five years later came a tumor like this. See, the tumor is a very low growth, but we need to follow the patient. We need to follow the MRI year by year to know that there is some acoustic neuroma that the great majority of them grows very slow, but you have some that you grow faster. Follow the tumor, follow the, the behavior of each case is very, very important when you treat benign disease. Now come the war. Today, we know that they are doing more radio surgery than surgery for acoustic neuron. And they say they is very effective, preserve the function, but security. I ask you, if you should do a radio, radio surgery tumor like this, six months like this, nine years like this, this patient is cured. No, the tumor is there. It means that the radio surgery is not a curative treatment. Maybe you have the control. Preserve the function. Maybe in the beginning. We know that the radiation therapy is not totally effect in one month, two months, six months. And the effect of radiation therapy can be for 10 years, 20 years. Not the good things, but the bad things. New tumor, vasculopathy, stroke, seizure, or transformation. It can happen in 10, 15, 20 years. Radiation therapy is designed for malignant tumor. Radiation therapy is not designed for benign tumor. It means that the only curative treatment for vestibular schwannoma is the total removal. Today they are coming with a new technology. They take the computer, they take the navigation, they take the, all the technology to say to us how much the tumor you should remove. Now they see adaptive hybrid surgery analysis. You go to surgery, you remove 
the area that is safe and leave one small piece. That is the best way, is the best treatment by radio surgery. The computer guide your hands. I don't know if this is the correct way to do medicine. Maybe in the future, who design the treatment or not the doctor, maybe the lawyer, maybe the company. This is changing in acoustic neuroma more than other pathology. For me, hybrid surgery is this. You do the surgery, you remove the maximum that you can but there is a small piece of tumor that is attached or very adherence, adherence to the facial nerve. When you try to remove the electrophysiologist say, don't go there, don't go there, you have damage. Okay, you leave. In this small residual tumor that you follow for some time, start to grow again, adhering to the facial nerve. Maybe in this situation, you can send to the radio cell. This is for me, the concept of hybrid cell. Do the maximum removal that you believe that's possible. And the residual that it, if it's growing, you can do radio surgery. We know that today, today that the radiation therapy induced tumor. You know that the worst meningioma is radiation induced. Do not send everybody to burn the head. Do with criteria. It's very, very important when you treat vestibular schwannoma. In the world today is so crazy that you see papers like this. Look at this, Professor Shirian, Professor O'Connor, let's listen. Efficacy of stereotaxy radio surgery for radiation induced meningioma. We treat radiation, they are treating radiation induced meningioma with radiation. And look the paper, the case that they are showing as example in the paper. Man, April 22, 2020. This tumor, I can give 10 centimeter margin of dura to remove this tumor. What making more sad, make me more sad, that you see as co-authors of this paper, some prominent neurosurgeons in the world that are giving lecture around the world, talk about radical removal, removal, but they put his name, his name or their name in this kind of publication. Real microsurgery today has been difficult life, but more than microsurgery, the patient life. We know the vestibular schwannoma improve a lot, not only the microsurgical technique, the new technology, as you saw, very nice presentation from Dr. Mu from Korea and, and the Professor Marchiori from Italy, wonderful technique, wonderful videos, very nice, very nice, very nice approach. Independent of the approach that you do. The idea is the radical total removal of the mass. I was the time that people was fighting retro sig, trans lab, trans thing, trans something. It's not this the goal. The idea is here, remove the tumor or burn their head. These are two opposites. The endoscope, 
is helping a lot. You see very nice paper and very nice uh, case show that Dr. Mu, maybe Dr. Mu has, has to organize, uh, have to compare his case with natural history of the disease, more than all the kind of treatment. And the trans lab give you very nice view of the facial nerve from control and this, and you do the cochlear implant at the same time is very nice, very nice idea. You should keep these ideas following. I do retro -seek. I prefer to do a retro -seek. As a neurosurgeon, you learn to work in the retro sigmoid area. 90% of the surgery in the skull base area can be removed by ptero approach with small radiation or retro sigmoid approach with small radiation. It does not mean that this variation you should not learn. We should learn temporal bone, we should learn trans lab, we should learn press sigma approach, we should learn cranial orthozygomatic. But as a neurosurgeon, you should be master in retro sigma approach. And for us that you are doing retro sigma every day, in our workhorse, you can go retro sigma approach. The position change. Some people like to do same sitting position. The field is very clean. You can see very well. But I, I not feel comfortable, you know? I don't feel comfortable right to see and sitting position or same sitting position. The people like to put their head, the hand there, and see it clean, it's very clean. The video will be wonderful. Some people just turn the head. I prefer to do in true lateral position and take the shoulder and pull it anteriorly. See? And I have the view directly from here. In this way, I will not turn the head. There is no problem to close the contralateral internal jugular vein. I prefer this. See, the problem with the shoulder, but if you pull the shoulder anteriorly, you can have a nice view. You do a retro sigmoid uh, um, craniotomy. I know that some people do craniectomy. I prefer to do craniotomy to put the bone back. See, because if you do craniectomy, the, the muscle, and it will be adherent to the dura, and some pa patient will complain of a headache. See, if you put the bone back, I think it will be better. The limit will be the posterior limit of the sigmoid sinus. In some situation, you dissect a little bit more, but the great majority of the time, if you have the transverse sinus and the sigmoid sinus, it is enough. This part I prefer to do with the drill. The other part we prefer to do with the craniotomy. See? See, it goes from the drill to be safe and expose the sigma sign in this area. To understand the anatomy and the idea where is the facial nerve is crucial, it's difficult to identify where is the facial nerve in the middle. But you know where is the facial nerve in the brain stand, you know where is the facial nerve in the internal auditory canal. You need to have the two stumps and follow from medial to lateral, from lateral to medial, and keep the middle, the tumor in the middle. I learned with masters as Professor Kono, as our friend here from Brazil, Dr. Velutini and Professor Sami. That there is arachnoid. And the idea is to keep the arachnoid to the vessels and to the nerve. I don't open the arachnoid to see the lower kernel nerves. I don't open the arachnoid to see the other nerves. I open the arachnoid like onion, you know, and go dissecting the arachnoid. 
and keep the, the tumor in the middle. After that, you have the nerves and the arachna. Sometimes, sometimes you don't see clearly the facial nerve because these red arachnoids in front of you will protect the nerve. You don't see the facial nerve so clear. Sometimes you see very clear the facial nerve when the patient wake up with facial pulse. Temporary, but we will we'll come back. The idea is to keep these arachnoids around. We open the internal auditory canal, we expose the tumor inside the internal canal, Exposed in the posterior fossa, and after you follow the tumor from medial to lateral to retract at least as you can the cochlear nerve. This is one video where a small tumor you see here. I'll try to move this. Oh, sorry. I'll take it again. You see, you open the canal wider where I can. The people ask me why I don't use too much uh, the diamond drill. I use the diamond drill when I'm over the nerve. When in the bone, I prefer to go like a, like a bone knife, you know? You go cutting, you see. You can use the 11 blade. You can use a smaller blade. Now I know that Professor Shirian is designing new blades. Dissect anterior to posterior. Uh, see middle to lateral, lateral to middle, in this direction also. See, sometimes I wanna remove totally in one piece, but when we start to mobilize, you see something happen in the neurophysiology, maybe you think better to remove a small piece and decompress the tumor in the pen of the size and go slowly trying to preserve the physiology, try to preserve the vascularization. One of the tricks of this vestibular schwannoma surgery is never coagulate, irrigate. See, in the minimum you coagulate, because you never know how, how breathe this coagulation to the nerves around. See, you go dissecting this way, you preserve the structure, right side, left side, in the patient, the post-op preservation of functional nerve, Interoperate hearing. You see, you see, there was a small piece of was down there. You go there and follow it. Okay. This is the simple one, the small one. There is the cap. It means that the hearing probably will be preserved. I say probably because sometimes in the in the intraoperative is perfect. The hearing is, looks per perfect. The vocal plantation is perfect. The patient wake up death. I don't know what's happening sometimes. The intraoperative to say everything is okay in the postoperative. It's surgery, something. Maybe ischemia, maybe some ischemia that come later. We have larger tumor like this when you do the same technique. You go there. Dissect the nerve, identify the structure. You go to internal autonomy, you see that the tumor here, you pull the arachnoid, like laterally. See how we are peeling the onion, see, to clean and leave just the tumor inside. You can do very slight coagulation. Oh, it's, it's too much. Okay. You open the internal auditory canal. Okay. okay. Open the internal canal. There is dura here. Now you do internal decompression. You do with, with, with a um, ultrasonic aspirator, or you can do just with a simple aspiration. You see? You go inside the tumor. After you decompress a lot, Max and you can. Now you are going outside and try to find this plan. When you find this plan with the arachnoid, it means that you are safe. See? Now you know where is the facial nerve. You keep the arachnoid here, never coagulate here. Some 
small bridge you see see the vent there the compressed there pull the rack noise there and cleaning just follow it you can remove the mess oh. now medium to lateral and keeping this structure see if it's red leave red and clean this here very very slowly in this direction here you see me in the bit very gentle this middle part is the most difficult that the friction nerve is attached you have to see there see there and try to see and remove the tumor in the post immediate post of the patient preservation of the facial nerve and keep it the anatomy of the nerve you can repeat this you can repeat again in same same surgery same technique sometimes the plan is easier sometimes place the plan is more difficult see but you do this same technique independent of the size you try to do the same technique larger will be the tumor more difficult will be to find this plan sometimes you find easily sometimes you don't find easily sometimes you hear is tumor that is attached to the nerve and to leave a small piece or not you see you can do and keep the anatomical position of the nerve same situation like this large tumor same situation in the immediate post-op see there is this very slight seven if you go to dissect the seven and see perfect maybe you have damage sometimes you do the surgery like this you don't see the nerves I have no idea where is the facial nerve in this situation is isn't this arachnoid it was very thick arachnoid what i did I dissect the arachnoid and I left the arachnoid to the porous into the brain stem. You see, in the post up like this. If you ask me where is the facial nerve this fish, I didn't see it. I saw just the arachnoid and I left the arachnoid to the anterior part. The larger tumor is more difficult, but you need to try to preserve the facial nerve. At least try, always. Go inside, decompress, and follow it. Same situation like this. Same situation like this. Large tumor, decompress, facial nerve in the brain stem, facial nerve in the internal auditory canal. Decompress the tumor and try to find the facial from the detergent, from the internal detonimators to the brain stand preserving the retinal. But the people say, why open the head? You, if you can do a radio surgery, you can control, there is no risk. Of course, if you do radio surgery, you should do radiation therapy, in the post radiation therapy, there is no death. There is no facial palsy. There, no, there is no trigeminal pain. There is no hearing loss. But it's a matter of time. Maybe not for the facial, it's less common, but the hearing is a matter of time. They will lose the hearing. They may have a terrible facial pain with anesthesia. It's extremely rare, it's extremely rare to have a case that you remove a vestibular schwannoma and the patient has in the post of anesthesia and pain. The facial pain, see? But it's not uncommon to have a facial pain see, with anesthesia that you call 
anestesia, anestesia dolorosa. I don't know how to say. Anestesia dolorosa is the worst complication that you can have in the treatment of a fibular schwannoma. This will almost never happen with surgery. It may happen with radio surgery. The, keep in mind that the treatment may be uh, have to consider not the immediate, see, the early results, but the long-term results. Period preservation in acoustic neuroma by, by microsurgery is forever. Hearing preservation by radio surgery is a matter of time. You can do the same situation here, very small tumor, you remove, patient happy, hearing preserve. This are like a diamond. This will be forever. These have to keep in mind that if you do microsurgery, if you remove the tumor, this patient will have his facial nerve and his hearing preserved for the entire life. Today, we just saw the presentation of Professor Mike Ori, very, very nice. We have two ways to, type, to restore the hearing. One, the, the brain standing implant. The other one is the cochlear implant. This will help you a lot. We published this a long time, uh, two years ago. The patient with hearing loss, very small lesion, completely deaf. We did the surgery and you, you use the same time the implantation of uh, using cochlear implant. This result is very good. The patient adapted very well, but the patient has to understand the physiotherapy to recover of the hearing, to adapt the hearing is a very important, very important uh, uh, part in the treatment. Not only the surgery, the post-op physical therapy for recovery of the hearing and to adapt the hearing is very important part of the treatment. More important than this is the intraoperative uh, the implant. This is a safe life procedure. What is a safe life procedure? To save the life of the patient. He will not recover the hearing perfect. He will continue to be almost deaf. But this procedure can save life. Do you know why? This guy can cross the street. If the car is coming, he can hear the noise of the car. If something wrong is happening, he can hear the noise of, of this. If he's doing very good physical therapy or uh, the, the phonotherapy and physical therapy in the post implant, they need a lot of efforts, a lot of, a lot of efforts. They can have not the real total normal life, but they will have a very good adapted life. This procedure is very important. A little bit that change for this guy that was totally deaf will be the best thing that you can do. If, if he can hear something, see, change completely his life. Sometimes I have a case like this that's coming in Brazil, that's coming in India, that's coming in Rio. You cannot save the facial nerve. The patient has facial pulse in the pulse up, but this beautiful lady is saving her life. This surgery is to save the life of the patient, not the facial nerve, not the hearing, is to save the life. I know that today many people showing tumor larger than this and saving facial nerve and saving hearing 
and saving everything. I'm sorry, but in my hands, it doesn't work this way. I have large tumor with vestibular show anoma, the facial pulse in the post office. Of course, I have cases like this. I have small tumors that I don't know what's happening sometimes, the facial pulse. It's surgery, it's neurosurgery, it's life of neurosurgeon. It's important, important to tell the truth. We only, a microsurgery and the, neuro, the neurosurgery will only survive against the machine, against the business, against the lawyer. You should tell the real truth for the patient. This beautiful lady was saving her life. The facial nerve was not totally safe. Now she's very happy. She's did some cosmetic treatment and some treatment to improve this facial palsy. We have new techniques to repair. This lateral procedure is very good for aesthetics. You see in the post off, looks nice. You have a new technique like this, you see? This you see, masseteric nerve transfer is a very, very nice result. This is the post op C. You see this is a long time. You see, is improving the quality of life. The quality of life is first tumor free. The quality of life is not be burned and be worried in the entire life that a new malignant tumor can come in your head because of treatment that you did. Quality of life is to be alive. Thank you very, very much. We changed the date, the corona changed our life and the skull based community will be in Rio, not in 2020, will be 2022 for the beautiful city of Rio de Janeiro. In this beautiful scenario, you have all the people there. You hope all these people that listen me now to be there in Rio in 2020. 2022, March 2022. Thank you very, very much and sorry for the long time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor Borba. This is a really fantastic presentation. A lot of carry home messages. Uh, well, I would like to ask Professor Ibchir and if he has some comments on this. Well, Louis, uh, as masterful as always, uh, and uh, Louis is a fantastic teacher as well. Um, he well, I've known him, known him for years. I've seen him operate uh, in Russia many, many times. And, uh, he, as good as he operates, he teaches as well. So it's always a great uh, honor to have him on board. Thank you, Luis. You are my friend. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh well, Professor Boba, can I ask you some questions, maybe? There is actually one yes. question from the delegate. Uh, how would you manage a case with hydrocephalus and a large acoustic neuroma? Large vestibular shown with hydrocephalus. Oh, for hydrocephalus? Yeah. Okay. You see, Dr. Kono is here. See, Michihiro Kono is here. To turn on his light. He's his head. The man of acoustic neuroma in the whole world. <laughs> we should ask him later. And uh, the hydrocephalus thing depends on this uh, situation, you know. You have some case here in Brazil that the tumor is large and the hydrocephalus is so large and the patient comes like in coma. If the patient has a severe hydrocephalus uh, uh, with intracranial hypertension, maybe you need to put the shunt. But in the great majority of the case, see, when you have hydrocephalus, you remove the tumor and keep the external drain in the post op. The great majority of the case, we do this. But if the patient arrives, no, 
In Brazil, it happens situation. Sometimes the patient come, you cannot do the surgery in the same day. There is a problem with the ICU. They have not have place in the hospital. You need to do the shunt or we need to refer the patient to another city. The shunt is a safe life procedure. If you are in the situation that you cannot do the surgery to remove the tumor as the first time, if you do the shunt, the shunt you save the life. It is a safe life procedure. But if you come to me, if I can do the surgery, I do the surgery in this large hydrocephalus, I keep the EVD, the EVD, external IVD in the, the post op. In the great panel at the time, you don't need, but it's safe, safe. Uh, well, my next question is, you actually uh, showed a series of cases where you did a simultaneous cochlear implantation. So was it a retro sigmoid approach with an implantation or a translab approach with an implantation? No, it's not possible. To do the same time, when yeah. you are planning to do the cochlear, you have to do the translab. See, mm, okay. this you, you you do the the cochlear implant, you do you, you go by translab and remove the tumor. See, the cochlear implant is a partnership with the ENT. You have to do together. You have to work together. See, the retro seek I do alone. But when you are planning to do the cochlear implant, the ET, ENT has to be together. I think the ENT should be also in the retro seat to help us in the something. But uh, <laughs> cochlear implant is fundamental, it's, it's crucial. No, there is no way to do this without ENT. It's always to do the, the translab. Also, also for the to implant, of in the brain stem is easier by translab, you know? The angle is easier to see, but you can put by retro C also, but by translab is easier to put the cochlear implant. Let's ask Dr. Kono if, how he does when he put in yeah, okay. the brain stem and implant. Professor Kono, pleasure yes. to see you. Hi, <laughs> nice talk, nice lecture. Yeah. I enjoyed it so much. And uh, so I, I, I don't have any experience of the brainstem uh, implants. But uh, so uh, can I can I can I say something? Uh, so about the arachnoid issue program. So you you said so uh, Bertini Bertini uh, insist. Yeah, uh, that, great that friend is, of mine. <laughs> But yeah. I, I don't I don't think that is uh, arachnoid. But uh, so firstly, so you remove the arachnoid membrane. That 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 was arachnoid, of of course. But uh, uh, between the uh, facial or cochlear nerves and the tumor, uh, there is uh, no arachnoid because uh, we believe most of the most is the subarachnoid tumor sub arachnoid tumor, not epi arachnoid tumor. So uh, sub arachnoid tumor has a uh, arachnoid membrane, uh, most uh, outer, outer side. So uh, seventh and the eighth cranial nerves and tumor, uh, so sandwich the uh, membrane uh, from the vestibular nerve. So uh, we believe uh, we have to so leave, uh, keep the membrane, not the arachnoid, uh, membrane from the vestibular nerve. Vestibular nerve, very thin, vestibular nerve fibers or uh, perineurium. So uh, uh, if I keep uh, the membrane, uh, so uh, uh, membrane, uh, so we can, we can easily to yeah. preserve facial and the cochlear nerve function. That's my comment. <laughs> yes, yeah, great. You call membrane, you don't call arachnoid. Because you see the nerve, there is one small membrane over the nerve. Yeah, yeah. That, not, that is, for you, it's not arachnoid, it's just membrane. Membrane, but uh, okay. it's not arachnoid. Yeah, so membrane. Yeah, but from... the idea, 
Yes, but the idea is to keep this membrane. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. You call yeah. membrane, I call arachnoid. So you call you, Paul, I call Peter. Okay. Brazilian, <laughs> so Brazilian. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I don't say, and that is okay. Good. As well. Okay. But the idea, okay. But the the main idea is the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keep this this membrane, yes, or this arachnoid or something like that, there to protect them. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you, sir. You are the man. <laughs> okay, the delegates are also open to make uh, comments and questions. There is Dr. Rebat. Redad? Yeah. Um, um, hi, Professor. I'm Dr. Redad from Jordan. Um, my young neurosurgeon just certified last March. Well, my questions in brief, um, in case of that huge or super large um, vestibular schwannomas where the lady had um, the facial palsy, in such cases, would you prefer to do partial resections and then you complete the remaining part in radio surgery? Did you get my question? Or should I yes, repeat? Yes, I understand. Okay. Don't know. Uh, this is the most difficult question today in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, I never do surgery trying to go, go to the surgery and say, I do partial removal. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. Because the time that I did this, the partial was too partial. See? Okay. What I do, I go to surgery and try to remove the maximum that I can, but following very, very close the intraoperative monitoring and try to identify the nerve. If I start to do the surgery, then I feel that I can lose the facial nerve. See? It's better to leave, you know? It's better okay. to leave on small piece. See? And but not give radio surgery later. Wait and see. Wait and see. Because sometimes this is small remaining tumor. Do not grow so fast. Sometimes it doesn't grow. And you can follow it with the time. I never sent patient to radio surgery in advance. I sent to radio surgery when there is approved growth of the tumor. Do you know what I mean? Was clear? Yes, sure. Thank you, sir. And thank you for the great presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comments from Professor Mark Shioni or Professor Moon? Um, yeah, um, one comment is about uh, um, the cochlear implants uh, in this in simultaneous cochlear implants. It's very important also the dissection that is right. You have to uh, preserve the arachnoid as much as possible. But another important aspect is to preserve the labyrinthine artery because uh, you know that this artery mm -hmm. run inside internally to a canal and uh, sometimes it's not easy to preserve. And if you coagulate this artery, sometimes you can have a good results at the beginning, but after following the patient, the patient can have some decreasing of the results. So it's really another important aspect uh, when uh, you are performing cochlear implants in, uh, in, in translab approach, it's use a cotonoid, preserve as much as possible or the small artery run along the, the internal auditory canal. That's a very good point. Yeah, very good point, very good point. Okay. Great. Professor Kono. Yes. Hi. When you do, when you do translate, never. <laughs> yeah. Uh... 3% 
of a patient, I used translability approach. And uh, what, what is this? I used translability approach for the, the case with the previous surgery uh, using retrosigmoid approach. So I do the new, new way. So uh, to use the translab, but uh, we why, usually- Why, why, why? Huh? Why you, why you do the new way? Pre previous surgery was done uh, via the retrosigmoid approach. So uh, I would like to so go a new way. So that's why uh, I use translab, but uh, only three percent because translab approach is very narrow, narrow approach. So I usually do the continuous facial nerve monitoring. So I need space. Okay. So that's why 97% of our patient, I use the electrosigmoid approach. More than 1,400 cases, I use the, most of our patients, I use the uh, electrosigmoid approach as, as you like, so as you. And, and uh, just uh, another comment uh, regarding the TransLab approach. And another indication in, in our department, because we are using also retrosigmoid approach, but uh, another indication for translab approach, especially when you have to do surgery in all the patients. When, for example, you have a patient over six, 75 with a huge tumor, in order to avoid to retract the cerebellum, in order to avoid to put in a semi-sitting position, and uh, probably in this patient, you can use a uh, decompression, removing as much as possible the tumor is not uh, so important to remove all the tumor, but to decompress because the age of the patient. And if you are using the translab approach, you avoid the retraction of a cerebellum that is really important. And uh, regarding the space and the surgical work in the translab, one of the most important secret is to decompress the sinus to decompress the middle fossa dura, and also to perform a transapical extension of the drilling through the internal drill canal. In this way, you can gain more space, of course. If you do a traditional translab, uh, you have uh, a, a small space with respect to the, the retrosigmoid, but if you do a transapical, sometimes you can manage without a problem. Hey, Bernard? Yes, John, I, John, I'm here, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Professor Boba, how often you do a translab approach? Because I know you're very good with the temporal bone. How often do you do, do you do a translab approach? Well, the true? Yeah. Why not? Never. <laughs> 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 the, just when um, we need to do uh, the cochlear implant, you were planning to do the, the cochlear implant. See, okay. just there, just there, just there. And how do you but really nice widen? Approach. Okay, okay. But Good. it's nice approach, it's nice approach. How do you widen your corridor in a retro-sigmoid approach? How often do you have pre-sigmoid exposure to retract the sigmoid sinus anteriorly to get a better space in a retro-sigmoid approach? For who? It's, it's, it's for me. Did you get, yeah, yeah. Did you, did you get my question? I, I'm asking you, how, how do you widen your corridor in a retro sigmoid approach? The tumor is very large. Do you combine a retro sigmoid with the middle fossa or you do a pre sigmoid drilling to retract the sigmoid sinus anteriorly? Do you do these maneuvers? For acoustic, you don't need. See? For acoustic, you, do, you don't need. I don't know. Because the tumor is in the posterior fossa. Sometimes you expose a little bit more the sigmoid sinus, but for acoustic, you, do, you don't need. See? Only if the tumor is going too middly, maybe can help you. But I think for acoustic, it's soft tumor. You decompress, it gives you the space. You see? Sometimes for meningiomas, that is, is, is hard, 
you need to a little bit more exposure, expose the sigmoid signs and transverse signs to rotate for large meningioma that you go in the posterior fossa. See? Because his heart is not moving so easy as acoustic. I think for, for acoustic, this is not so easy. No, no, about the trans lab. I used to do the, the, the I'm using to do the retro seek, but the way the, the, the time that I did with the ENT, the trans lab, the view is very nice. <laughs> The view is in the angle of visualization is very nice. It's very nice. I think for tumors that's not so large. See, the patient has hearing loss, and you are planning to do the intraoperative implant. It's a very good choice. It's a very good choice. The angle, Dr. Connor, you see, you see by trans lab, the, the, the angle looks straight, it's direct, it's very nice, you see. And you see also the fourth ventricle, see? The from the Lushka, you see almost directly there, you see? The view is very nice. The problem that trans lab for me is that, that Dr. O'Connor said, you never know the size of the press sigmoid dura, press sigmoid space. If the, if the sigmoid sign, uh, sinus is huge, your space can be smaller. You need to mobilize the sinus. It's not easy to mobilize the sinus. And more you mobilize the sinus, more the possibility to have thrombosis of the sinus. It's one issue you can do. But for a small tumor, patient with hearing loss, if we are planning to do implant, is ideal approach, ideal approach. But the ENT are, are using to do the, the trans lab. They're doing very, very well, very fast, I think. The most important, and don't centrate your surgery, see? Do surgery. <laughs> and also, also uh, we have to give up, give up the hearing preservation for large tumors if, if we use the trans lab ENT approach. So retro sigmoid approach, uh, can provide the possibility of hearing preservation for uh, larger tumors. So that that's a, so another reason. Uh, there's actually one question from the delegate. Uh, how much of retraction of the cerebellum is safe? How much of retraction in the cerebellum is safe? Zero. How much? <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Do you mean zero uh, is safe? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, the same thing I can ask you. How safe is dissect put the drill over the sigmoid sinus? Mm. Zero. Okay. You can dissect, can damage, can thrombose can happen. But for acoustic neuroma, the retraction of the cerebellum is not so high. You don't need to retract too much. Don't need to. The great one majority person. of the time, you have, you have the space. See? And the cerebellum come down alone. See, I use the spatula to protect against my instrument sometimes, not to retract. Because you are doing the instrument, go inside, sometimes you can touch the cerebellum. I use just to hold, but not to pull, not to pull back like this. See? When um, you leave this in the end of the surgery, you retract, you remove the retract, the, the spatula, the cerebellum is there. It's quiet. But you are not retracting, you're just protecting the great matter of the time. But I think Dr. Cohen want to say something. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I totally agree with you. So we don't we don't use uh, retractor. Uh, so 
So 1% of sw uh, cerebral sw swelling risk. Yeah. But, but the swelling is not by, not by retraction. The swelling is because of vein sometimes. Mm, that's true, that's true. Then some vein, more vein than real retraction. See? In the vein, you can damage in any approach. See? That's true. Uh, well, I think there are no more questions from delegates. There is a lady uh, here, her name. How you spell, how you spell your, your surname? al -Kataka. how do you say this? Oh, Al-Khataiba. Al-Khataiba. Yeah, good. thank you. Um, well, well, please. So, yeah. um, well, one more question, uh, if you don't mind. Um, I was wondering how often you use the facial nerve monitoring intraoperatively, if you ever use it. 100%. Perfect. If there so, is no possibility to do intraoperative monitor facial nerve, no surgery. Perfect, okay. Okay? Yeah, thank you. But I wish, I wish to have the same technology that Professor Kono has for intraoperative monitoring, with these small ships that he put close to the brain stem. One day you have this, one day, maybe in 20 years. <laughs> continuous monitoring, continuous monitoring. Yes, yes. continuous monitoring. Continuous now the new, the new, Now the, the, the new equipment from some company, I cannot say the name, you they are to... doing continuous monitoring. Yes. But this, uh, no, not the, how to say? Not the free running. So continuous stimulation. So a uh, unique medical from Japan. Yeah. Ball type, ball type electrode on the facial. Yeah. It's continuous stimulation all the time. It's become what? very easy to do surgery. See? So what helps? What helps yeah. uh, frequency uh, stimulation? So. During during tumor dissection, we can we can monitor during tumor dissection. So yeah. it's strongest but monitoring. It's continuous stimulation, yes. Yes, one health uh, high frequency, okay. high frequency, nearly continuous. It's, okay, it's not continued monitoring. I yeah. do continue okay. monitoring. You do continuous Very stimulation. Yes. Very high frequent stimulation. Yeah, this is the trick. But only in Japan. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, Tatajiba. Tatajiba. So what, want one? To, want to try, yeah? He want to buy one, but he, he doesn't have. No. Maybe, maybe soon you have this. This great idea because it's the continued stimulation is perfect. Yes. We are doing continued monitoring. Yes. The same to us. When we stimulate, it's completely different than monitoring. See? Mm, stimulation. Stimulation. Okay. Good. Yeah. This is a trick. Thank you. Yeah. Now it's lunch time in Brazil. See? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, it's running late here, too. I think if there are no more questions from delegates. We could probably conclude this session. So I would like to thank again all the speakers, Professor Mark Shoni, Professor Insio Moon, Professor Aib Charyan, Professor Louis Borba, and, and Professor Kona also for giving us their, ex their experience, their expertise, everything in a nutshell of two minutes, two hours, sorry. So an excellent presentation again. So thank you once again, all the speakers. And I would also like to thank uh, Dr. John Bennett, I think I would, I, would, I would have already given him the Nobel Prize for his service in my mind. It's an excellent service he's doing for all the medical fraternity. And I know that he's spending sleepless nights behind this neurosurgical TV. Thank you, Dr. John Bennett, once again. And also thank you, Dr. Hira and uh, Dr. Voralex for helping us with this webinar, webinars. So thank you all. Probably we could conclude the session over to Dr. John Bennett. Okay, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for all the kind words, uh, especially Dr. Borber. Thank you very much. 
and uh, Dr. Cherian, uh, he was with us from the very start. Uh, he gave me the inspiration actually to explore the neurosurgery space. Uh, what's the topic next week, Vinod? Uh, I would, I not confirmed it so far, uh, Professor Jonai. Maybe I'll confirm and get back to you in a couple of days. Okay, we'll see you next week, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.